Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly, or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows, and by him deeds are weighed. The bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumbled are armed with strength. Those who are full hire themselves out for food, but those who are hungry are hungry no more. She who was barren has oh, born seven tried. sons, I before so as many sons pined away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and makes them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's, on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful servants, but the wicked will be silenced in the place of darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, but the boy ministered before the Lord unto Eli the priest. That's brilliant, thank you. Hannah's prayer. Um, and it's interesting uh, because in this in this uh, book one Samuel, when we read about Hannah, um, a lot of the um, writing about her concerns her praying. Actually, um, she is a woman of faith, um, so there's a lot of praying going on. Um, so there's a guy uh, called Alvin Toffler, and he wrote this. He said, "You've got to think." about big things while you're doing small things. You've got to think about big things while you're doing small things so that the small things go in the right direction. We've been talking about God has a big thing in mind. The nation has kind of come down and all sorts of faith and spirituality issues going on. It's not in a good place. And God's got a, a thing in mind. He wants to redeem these people, bring them back. And he's got this, this plan of redemption for the world, which is inexorably moving forward. And as we pray and follow him as we serve him he points us in the right direction we are part of something big that god is doing do you think of your faith in that way that we're not in isolation he invites us to join him in what he's doing he's building his kingdom and he describes us in the new testament as um, living stones, we're being incorporated into this living thing that he's building. As we pray and follow him and serve him, he points us in the direction. We become part of his movement, his kingdom movement. And lots of smaller events and activities and transactions that are all part of the day-to-day -day stuff of our lives are part of this big thing that he's doing. Do you, do you realize that you're part of this big thing? And that's why praying and reading our Bibles are important. Daily, keeping that connection, going with him, listening. Our lives may seem small and mundane and ordinary. I'm just one person. How can I make a difference? But Jesus invites us to bring everything to God, to pray, to talk to him about it. And we align what seems to us the small things, but actually they're an important part of the big thing, the big thing. He invites us into that. We run the danger every day of thinking, I don't matter. 
my life doesn't make a difference. The little thing that I can do is just the smallest drop in the biggest bucket and all the rest of it. However, here's an example of, of something um, that, uh, that I read. During World War II, the pilot of an American aircraft, uh, a bomber actually, flying over Germany. The pilot's flying and is holding this aircraft on course and all the rest of it. And as he was flying over the target, he felt the aircraft be struck by anti-aircraft fire. He felt the strikes going through the aircraft and he saw the strikes hit the fuel tanks in his wings. And at that moment, he thought it was the end. He held his breath and he just waited for the explosion to disintegrate the aircraft that they were in. And nothing happened. He completed the mission. He got the aircraft and the crew back. And after landing safely back at base from the mission, the pilots went to see the engineers who were looking at the holes in the aircraft and uh, fixing it uh, ready for next time out. And um, the engineers told the pilot, they said, uh, there are 11 unexploded cannon shelves in the wings of this aircraft, in the fuel tanks in the wings. Now, because of safety, all the protocols that were there as well, the cannon shells had to be defused by armourers on site because it was all very dangerous and they thought these things could go off at any time. So the armourers got in and there's a lot of interest going on on this aircraft and the armourers took these 11 shells out of the wings and began the process of making them safe. And as they did so, they discovered that these 11 cannon shells were empty. They had no um, explosive charge in them at all. They couldn't really do the damage they were designed to do. They were empty except for one. And they opened one, this one cannon shell and they had a look inside and it contained, rolled up very tightly inside it, a small scrap of paper. And it uh, then rolled it and it was written in Czech and they got somebody in and they translated what was written on this little note. And it said this, this is all we can do for you now. And these cannon shells have been manufactured under duress in a munitions factory. Um, and these Czech heroes, um, as best they could, were sabotaging the production line to make these cannon shells duds to help the Allies in their mission to liberate Europe. We don't know who these, these munitions workers were. We don't know how many shells they were able to sabotage in this way. And they thought that they were not doing much at all. This is all we can do for you now. For the nine crewmen on that aircraft, they saved their lives. You see the difference? You see, you see what a small thing can make in the big scheme of things. Small, quiet works contributed to something much bigger, the ultimate liberation of, of Europe. Out of hundreds of thousands of shells, their small act of sabotage seemed insignificant. But actually, small things contributed to that big thing of liberation. Back to the story of Hannah and what's going on with her people, uh, Israel at this time. It's a terrible thing when a nation is under a bit of a spiritual cloud. And that's kind of where the nation was at at this time, lost its way a little bit. A bit of a spiritual darkness. Um, we could think of uh, oppression in our world as well when countries are put down, communist China, North Korea, uh, and so on, that oppression of faith. Um, we can see examples. Just before the Great Awakening in colonial America, and the year was 1740, just before that awakening happened, when men like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield saw huge revival across the land. Earlier that same year before revival came, 1740, the outlook seemed bleak. 
seemed dark. A guy called Samuel Blair wrote these words in 1740. He says, religion lay as it were a dying and ready to expire its last breath in this part of the visible church. That's how it felt. He thought, it's dying. Lord, where are you? And then within months, revival came. Revival came. They say the darkest hour is right before the dawn. If you know your Bob Dylan, that one's in Meet Me in the Morning, a track. Things are pretty dark in Israel. Because the darkness has crept into the lives of the spiritual leaders. We'll read more about this next week. And God is going to do something about it. Into the heart of the very worship system that's supposed to point to God. It's not working the way it should. But God is at work. Secretly, quietly. It seems just a little thing. One woman and her story of desolation. Desolation. But through the prayers of this troubled woman, Hannah, and a son that she's going to give back to God, dedicates. God made a gift of a son to Hannah, and she in turn gifted him back. She dedicates Samuel to God. Now, uh, Dylan mentioned earlier, we're familiar with this idea uh, our own version, if you like, of a dedication service and how we dedicate uh, a young child, a baby, when parents and families present their child in a service. We know how that's done. And we give thanks. We pray. We ask for God's blessing. We make commitments to raise the child with a knowledge and understanding of Jesus, don't we? That's, that's how we do it. Samuel's dedication is a bit different, very different. When the family arrives at Shiloh, they don't even seem to have an appointment with Eli, the priest, let alone have a service arranged. It's kind of, do you remember me from three, four, five years ago? Do you remember us? Well, here we are, and here he is, bump, and off they go. That's kind of how it's summarized. But notice, as part of this as well, there's this act of praise and worship and celebration. They bring a huge sacrifice as part of this dedication and handing him over. For them, it's a big deal. And Samuel's dedication is as what they, they call in the Old Testament a Nazarite. And uh, the term Nazarite comes from Hebrew words that kind of mean to consecrate, to, to separate or set apart. And this is what is happening with Samuel. It's all there in Numbers 6 in the Old Testament. Normally, usually in the Old Testament, a Nazarite uh, is an adult, normally makes a vow or a promise possibly associated with a, a, re a request from God, often they're time limited. But in this case, Hannah makes the vow for him. There is something going on in this child's life, something going on through his mum. Most Nazarite vows were time limited, do a task, whatever. Some Nazarites were under lifetime vows. You could think of Samuel, but the Samson, in the Old Testament, in the judges there, and as John the Baptist in the New Testament, similar sorts of lives, committing of lives. As part of a vow, a Nazarite would, um, would, would uh, not cut their hair. And just to let you know, I'm having a haircut tomorrow, okay? Mine is getting a bit long, I realize that. But um, Nazarite wouldn't cut their hair. They'd abstain from alcohol, from, from wine and stuff. They would avoid um, dead bodies and uh, dead creatures and that kind of thing. And all these behaviors seem a bit strange to us, but it's all about symbolizing a lifestyle that is set apart, that is holy, that is pure, that is concerned and for God, concerned with God and all about being for God. Very different to the dedications we're used to in our services. And then there's 
There's another meaning of this word dedication going on in these verses that we've read as well. In, in Hannah's prayer in chapter 2, something of her amazing faith, her dedication to God comes through in the words of the prayer that, Sh- that Shanley read for us. It's, it's almost like a psalm that she's written, that prayer. It really is worth a read again. But there's a, there's a couple of things. There's, there's part psalm there. My, my heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord my horn is lifted high. My, mo- my mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like you. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. And then she touches on part testimony in this prayer as well. She talks about being lifted up. He raises the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and makes them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. On them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful servants. And then the story ends with this ever so simple line. The passage closes as they've arrived at the temple. It says, then Elkanah and presumably his family, he's the head of the household, then Elkanah and family went home to Ramah. But the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli the priest. The boy ministered. When was the last time you allowed a child to minister for you? Today. Today. It's interesting. We'll read later on that the people, the nation, recognize God's anointing on the child, Samuel. Come to that in a couple of weeks. Hannah has just spent a few short years at home with Samuel, that's all, maybe five years tops. And then she entrusts him to God. She's a woman of faith. She understands something is going on. And I just want to close with two thoughts for you to take away. The first one is this, women and children. Back in these times, end of Judges, Samuel, those, those times, it's a patriarchal, Old Testament, man's world context. And yet, it's the faith of a woman that God chooses as his starting point. So often the case, actually, in Scripture. If you read the New Testament closely, you will see that both Jesus and Luke and John's Gospels especially, and the Apostle Paul, have a look in Acts and his letters, you'll see that both of them challenge cultural norms by elevating the role of women. And children, Samuel's ministry begins at round about five years of age-ish, Ministers before the Lord. God's anointing on him is going to be recognized. Jesus uses children as a model of faith, childlike, not childish. I guess this is the future of the church in a way, the next generation that we're talking about. And I would say to you, it deserves investment. Our children and our young people deserve investment. Your time, my time, and so on. They do. Hannah invested in Samuel right from the beginning. Right from the beginning. Our cultural mentality, our 21st century thinking, we tend to dwell on the emotional angst of Hannah leaving Samuel with Eli from around the age of five, giving away her son. How could she do that? Yet I suspect, strongly suspect, that Hannah had prepared him right from the beginning. I suspect Samuel knew precisely the place that God had in his mother's life. 
faith of that veracity and sincerity was his starting point. This is what faith looks like. My mum modelled it to me. This is what faith looks like. And folks, this morning, what I've got to say to you is this. Your children, your grandchildren, know how important your faith is to you. They can see. They can tell. They know. Because it's shaped your lives every day. Your children and grandchildren know how important your faith is to you. And that will shape their own lives more significantly than you probably realize. There are, well, you're their, you're their primary, primary example. You're their role model. If staying close to Jesus is not your priority, how can you expect it to be theirs? They look to you to set the example. Second thing I want to talk to you is where we started, the place of apparently small things. In her prayer, Hannah assumed right at the beginning that the broken heart of a relatively obscure woman, a nobody, she assumed that that meant something to God. She trusted that he would hear her. The broken heart of a relatively obscure woman, she believed that meant something to God. And it did. And it still does. It still does. On the face of it, Hannah was just another with problems in her life. But closer inspection, as Eli discovered, reveals huge faith and a deep trust in God. And apparently small thing leads to a bigger thing. Samuel will come along, he'll need, lead the nation, and things will turn around. David will come, and so on. Part of an even bigger thing that God is doing in a nation. There is faith, there's persistence, there's humility here. And looking at Hannah, I guess our cry should be, Lord, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray. Let's just be still for a moment. Father, we, um, we read this account of Hannah and her prayers to you, how you answer them, and then this handing over of Samuel. And we get caught up in, in probably the, um, the, the, the feelings and the emotions of the situation and um, question what it would be like to do that. But Father, when we look at this as, and the faith that sits behind it, and how actually the best thing that Hannah could probably do was commit her child to you and your care. And that through her prayer, you're, you're building her into your big plans and purposes. Father, we're in awe of this, but we bring to you our lives and where we're at and how we live and the part we play. And this morning, we just come to you again and offer ourselves and our lives to you. Help us to remember that you hear us, you invite us to draw close and fit in with what you're doing. That our lives are never so small and insignificant that you would ignore us. You're interested, you're concerned, you care. And we praise you for that. In Jesus' name. Amen.